We ask every speaker to choose their own theme to you. John, that was some Grateful Dead. Why did we just hear from them? Uh, well, I, uh, it, it came from a, a, ref, a, a mention of the Whole Earth Catalogue on Friday by Catherine Dutrois. And uh, I, had a, I had already thought that Ripple from the Grateful Dead might be a good play. And she mentioned the Whole Earth Catalogue. And that got me thinking because I, I had been involved a little bit with the, production, with the British production of the Whole Earth Catalogue in London in the 70s. And I'd worked with a man there, art director called Pierce Marshbank. And Pierce used to play the Grateful Dead very loudly. I mean, unbelievably, ear splittingly loudly, and in his studio, and the sound reverberated through the whole house. He introduced me to the Grateful Dead. So the Grateful Dead, the whole Earth catalogue, was sort of fixed in my mind together. And, and then I thought, I'm actually in Norfolk at the moment. I'm, I'm uh, not where most of my books are, but I do have some copies of the whole Earth catalogue here. And so I thought I'd go back to the whole Earth catalogue and see what they said about work. And when I discovered that they were saying, <laughs> really, you know, work is, work is, you say I'm an expert on work. I mean, that is, that's a real turn off. I mean, work is such a down subject. Um, I, I, I do not confess that, but I, uh, and I'm not an expert on work. I'm fascinated by it, uh, what it means and why we do it. But um, I discovered the whole Earth catalog had some, things and products about work um, 50 years ago that absolutely tune with my own thoughts about work. So, um, we better, John, we better just explain, yeah, for, we better just explain what the whole Earth Catalog is for, for anyone who might. It, it, was, it was started in San Francisco in the mid 60s and it was, it was headlined by, it was started by a man called Stuart Brand and who's done many other things. It, it was not one person, but many people. But Stuart Graham was one of the key people, absolute key people. And um, it was after the moon landings, and he was not the moon landing, but the first photographs. And he was, he came up with this sort of idea that the 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 American particular, it was a very American publication, American particular, um, had a new sense of itself and a new sense of power and. He had this phrase that I think came from Buckminster Fuller, which was, we are now as gods. We can travel through space. We are now as gods. We might as well get good at it. But this was pre-web, pre-internet. Access to information was very limited. So he decided to publish what in effect was a massive um, Sears Roebuck type sales catalog of ideas and products it was essentially he said the ideas are for free the products you've got to you've got to buy but he just put stuff out there in a typical Stuart brand way and so it was a it was a sort of alternative hippie funky sales catalog from everything how to build your own house to how to become a shaman to philosophy to idea to the right sort of tool it was the sort of frontiersman frontiers man DIY, self-sufficiency, what we now call off-grid life, um, done in the spirit of humanity. That's what it was about. And if I can share my screen now, I can, I can, um, I might need help with this, but we'll do what we can. Here we are. This is one of, this is, this is a, a photograph I took last night from the whole Earth catalogue. It's not from the original catalog, it's from a reprint that was done a bit later on. And it, it, uh, uh, one, one of the themes of my book is that it's making the difference between um, work, which is what the book's about, and jobs, which is what economists talk about, and what business talks about, and what, what, what politicians usually talk about. So it's, mon it's earning money without a job, which has been my guiding principle for most of my life. Um, and it was wonderful to find that in the Hell Earth catalog of 50 years ago. And, and the next one, um, if I can, here we are, is um, go hire yourself an employer. 
And it, it, this struck home for me because it seems to me that one of the one of the trends of work is that we are we workers by whom I am, you, I mean everybody who works. So it could be chief executive, uh, could be a board director. Anybody who works is a worker. That seems to be the only useful, meaningful use of that word. Um, any worker, workers now they they go out and get jobs. They get employers and they they use offices as tools. They're no longer people that are given an employer, given a job, given an office. Uh, the, the power has switched from the organization to, to the individual. Um, so I'm going to, uh, there, there are four, three or four themes of what I'm going to be talking about. One is that the work is not a job. The, the second is that work, um, as I see it, is a, it's a humanist endeavor. It's, it's not purely a, a, a kind of economic transaction. Um, it's a process and it's a, it's a humanist process. We should look at this through humanist eyes. Um, and the other thing is that, that when you try to find it, the only, um, the only sensible way I can find it is, is, is it's a state of mind. Um, again, it's not tied to an organization, not tied to a job, not tied to an office. We can have a work set of mind um, where, wherever we are. Um, so I'm going to be talking about those, those three themes. Um, and I'm going to start by looking at what work is, and then I'm going to talk about what, what, uh, what invisible work is, which is my particular interest, and I'll say what that is. And then I, I'm going to talk about the effect of these trends on offices, what an office looks like inside, its design inside, it, the buildings that we are in, the locations, and so and the size of them as well. And as Ed has said, most of the things I'm talking about, the book was written before COVID took off, if that's the right word. Um, and the trends I'm talking about have become more marked in the last two or three months. Um, the future of work is, is, is rushing towards us at high speed. But the trends that I'm talking about and that are shaping how we work now have, have been around for some years, many, many years. Um, not much has changed except we are now beginning to work in different ways or more people are working in, in different ways. So I, I'm, I'm going to start with, I, I promised to do a short um, a history of work in about 90 seconds. It's the switch from what I call visible work to invisible work. This is a photograph. I took it off of a photograph in the Royal Academy show on the Russian Revolution about three or four years ago. And it's a, it's a hero of the Soviet Union uh, photograph, I think in Moscow in 1922. And he's doing what I call is manual work, it's physical work. But it's, 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 from my point of view, the importance of it, it's, vi it's visible work. Two people can look at this guy and we know exactly what he's doing. And we know when he starts and when he stops. And we know probably how, how well he's doing it. So that's visible, observable work. And that, that still happens. It still happens, but it's diminishing. And then I... I try to sort of describe what happens in corporate world and, and business, and I decided to show a spreadsheet. Um, the, there's a lot of research done in the, in, the, in the 60s, published in 1962, that said half of the American economy was dependent upon data. So this is a spreadsheet, boring spreadsheet, um, we all know what they are. They, they sometimes help. They often don't help. Um, this is a spreadsheet, and this is where we. Have, this is this is a picture, typical work now. Any time in the last 30, 20, 10 years, I suppose. Um, although if you know, there are charges of the phone, so this is the last five years. Um, and I like this because this showed this. This was a. This was a, a slight. This was the. This was photographed in London. 
in um, about five years ago. It's the Cass Art Store in Soho. And I, I liked it because it sort of summed up uh, the spirit of the creative economy, which in, in a way the, the Brits started the concept and it went, of course, creativity was going on forever, but the idea that the fact that this was financially, economically important started in Europe. Let's fill this town with artists. And, and, and this is the spirit now for uh, a, lot of, a lot of capital cities. Um, this is where we are now. This is a photograph of an airport lounge. And when I was there, I was looking around the room and I was trying to work out what everybody was doing. And I couldn't. I didn't know whether they were working or not. I didn't know if they were looked as though they were working, they might be thinking about their work or their colleagues or their project or the fact the plane was late or, or the children weren't, weren't, they weren't going on with their children or they were bored. I, you could look at these people and you couldn't tell whether they were working or not. You literally couldn't tell whether they were working or not. And this echoed um, some experiences I was having. I was working with a little startup, about 15 people um, in, 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 um, in Hoxton. And I went there three days a week for about three, four years. I knew everybody there very well. I knew what, we, what the projects we were working on. And I met the management every day. And then I'd look around the office and I would see these people who I knew very well. I'd hired a lot of them, half of them. And again, I could look at someone and I would not know whether they were actually working or not. And in a way it didn't matter because, you know, I thought they would be working. Um, I didn't know, but we were doing good work. We were making money. We got a lot of clients and the business was doing well. Um, didn't really matter whether I knew at that precise moment where they were, I didn't, but it didn't really matter. What did matter to me and what, what, what irritated me was that I didn't know whether their work was going well or badly. If, if it was going well, that was fine. If it was going badly, then I and others should be able to um, give them some support or help them or give them more resources or whatever it was. But we didn't know. They would be looking at their screen, sometimes with headphones on. We didn't know. And it was then that I began to realize that the important cognitive, creative, innovative work that makes the difference to an organization is something that even a neighbor, even a colleague cannot observe is taking place. Um, and, that, and that puts a huge challenge to management because unless we have formal meetings or we have um, water cooler conversations, um, we don't have an opportunity to be as helpful as we could be. Um, and that, that's a real problem for management. Um, and it, it, it also makes it hard in particular to know how to reward people. Um, because the link between effort and reward is also tenuous. Um, in, in the old days, to, if, you were, if you were turned, if punctuality, being present, being obedient was sort of enough, you got paid at the end of the week. Nowadays, it's, it's apart from things like age and seniority and grade, which are sort of framework issues, um, when you nail down to how much is that person contributing to the organization, um, it's not measurable, it's not visible, and it's, it's really, really, really hard to measure. Um, it's a dynamic thing and it's, it's very subjective, it's very, very hard to measure, and that's a problem for management. I realize that working at this company, Tornado Productions, um, that this was a, this beginning to be a major problem. Um, and so, uh, over the last few years, I have been, um, uh, as some people know, I spend a lot of time in airports, and this is Singapore Airport. Um, 
and I try and guess what people are doing. And it's very hard. This guy, the guy in the yellow t-shirt I discovered later on was a Korean. He was working with a, he was a games developer. He's working with a games developer I knew, so we had a conversation. What the other guys were doing, I, I, I don't know. This guy is in Medellin, uh, Medellin Airport in Colombia. He's obviously incredibly stressed. But, you know, is it work? Is it, is, this, is he having a row with his wife? Is his company bankrupt? Is his sports team losing? Is his plane late? I don't know. Um, another worried man, this is, this is someone who used to live about four miles from where I am, W.G. Siebold, uh, a wonderful, wonderful writer, novelist, poet, um, looking worried. So indeed, they're both, they're, I mean, I just switch between these people. I just don't know what they're up to. And they could be working, they could be not working. I don't know. This is a cafe, typical scene. Um, working or not, I don't know. Another cafe. Um, uh, I like this one because it's, J it's where J.K. Rowling wrote the first Harry Potter. She's gone back there. Um, this is a picture I share a lot. I ask people, how many people in this picture are working? Can you, can you count out the number of people who work? And almost everybody says one, one person is working. The guy in the high vis is working. And the rest, well, they're, you know, they're not working. I say, come on, this is, this is King's Cross concourse on a Friday night. Probably everybody, almost everybody is working. And they, even if we have a conversation on that, they still, many people find that hard to cope that the, the, they're all workers. The guy that wearing high vis is actually no more or less a worker than everybody else. We are so attuned to thinking of some people who are doing physical work as doing hard, as doing work, and that's hard work. And other people are doing, but I don't know. I spoke at a conference on work at the Royal College of Art about two years ago, and quite spontaneously, I asked everyone in the room, about 200 people in the room, um, experts on work, I said, as of this moment, how, how many people in the room are actually working? And half the people put their hands up. No, a, a third of the people put their hands up. I then said, and, and how many people are not working? Another third put their hands up. And so I said, how many people don't know? And a third put their hands up. These are experts on work, attending a conference on work, and they don't know if they're working or not. So we are, we are confused about um, whether what we are doing, whether what the state of brain is, our, as I said earlier, work is a state of mind, whether that constitutes work or not. Um, uh, these guys are working, um, and uh, you will recognize them, Scorsese being, this, this is a screening of the Irishman in London. Scorsese, very businesslike. De Niro, typical Hollywood, dresses down, couldn't care less, um, West Coast. Pacino, very East Coast, theatrical, um, very flamboyant. Um, um, and this guy, I like this guy because he, well, I mean, if you saw someone in your office working or doing this, would you think, what's he playing at? But one wants to know what he's going to do next. So I come back to this. Now, what I'm, what I'm um, wanting to suggest is that what these people are doing, and I will, I, I will try and quantify it very briefly. It's very hard. Roughly, 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 there's a very, very high correlation between people whose main work is invisible and those who's not, and it's 50-50. And the, the correlation is between those who go to university all day. If you go to university and you've got three or four years of using your brain, using your mind, arguing, putting your case forward with your contemporaries, your peers, you, you get into the habit of doing that and you want a job that allows you to do that. And you go on doing it and you get better at it. And if you don't go to university, you tend to take another kind of job and often not a very interesting job uh, and it pays less well 
and it, there's hardly any movement between the two. So roughly 50-50. Um, so I'm going to talk about the 50 that are doing invisible work. And it seemed to me to have some recurrent characteristics. Um, it's, it's cognitive. It is primarily cognitive. It, 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 also, it always has a strong emotional heft. Uh, it has emotional energy. It uses emotion. But it is primarily cognitive. It's very personal. Um, it, it, it starts in, in, in deep privacy. We, we have ideas in deep privacy. We, um, we can change our mind, we can change our mind back again, nobody knows, nobody cares. Um, and then of course we have to bring it out. We have to communicate it. Um, it's very subjective. This kind of work comes up with ideas, with opinions, with comments suggestions, proposals, perspectives, doesn't produce, it uses facts, but facts are never the clincher. It's the, it's the subjective interpretation and the way that is formulated and articulated that, that makes the difference. It's never ending. Ideas are never ending. Um, we all have lots of ideas. We say lots of things. We may say something quite casually to somebody and then completely forget about it and for some reason they remember it and they come back and they use it and um, in a meeting it's often very hard to remember where an idea which how an idea sort of emerged in the meeting who who was responsible for the idea uh, and um, very hard to remember and then we can all forget and then the next morning someone might think Hey, that, that thing that somebody said, you know, that was really interesting. They might remember it wrong. I mean, there's no guarantee we'll remember ideas right. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Um, so ideas are non-conclusionary, never-ending. And then fifthly, our nomadic. And we have ideas and we work on them um, wherever we happen to be. There's a lot of research that asks people where they where they have their ideas, where they work best. And pretty much it all comes down to about people say, you know, 50% in the office, 50% out of the office. And those in the office, half say, well, at my own desk, my own workspace, or in a meeting. And half say, well, I don't know, it was sort of when I was sort of having a chat with so and so. So Ideas, in other words, tend to emerge when we're not doing our focus work uh, in our focused place. Um, so those, those are the five characteristics. Um, and I'm, I'm now going to, I'm, I'm now going to move on a little bit to um, how this plays out in the office. Um, so that's that's where that's my my standard image of work today. This is a business class lounge, work class lounge in Heathrow. Uh, it's the same in every airport in the world, and that's my sort of recurring image of invisible work. Uh, people will be looking at me, and it, it, oddly enough, I kept on taking photographs of people, and they no one ever pays slightest bit of attention. Um, so in a way, if I was asked to convey a typical office, or if I wanted a sort of image of an office, that's, this is the sort of office that it's, um, and, and then inside, this is a games company in Shanghai, I think. Um, but we are moving at one, one, um, development is these extraordinary offices that are now being built by the internet online data giants um five billion us dollars worth of office um and they've almost become this is langlands and bells they've always become a sort of a sort of platonic ideal of an office i think this is a very beautiful image um, 
this is in a way uh, this is the Rem Courthouse CCTV center in Beijing. When I go to Beijing, I stay in a hotel, which is very close. I look out at this building a lot. I like it. I think it's extraordinary, wonderful. The locals are very, have very mixed views about it. They call it the man with his trousers down. And the Chinese government doesn't really like it. Xi Jinping refused to go to the opening ceremony, I was told. Um, but I think it's a beautiful building. This is another building in China. This is, this is the headquarters of Tencent, which is the, probably the China's most interesting tech company. And they were on a very squashed site. Um, and so they had a very small footprint, so they had to go up. They also wanted to, to be horizontal. Um, they probably looked at Apple Park, well, we can't do that. But, so they had these two um, sets of, of groups of horizontal floors um, linking the two buildings. And I don't know, it's either, it's either, it either works well or it's, it's, a, it's a compromise that fails every possible aesthetic test, I don't know. Um, it's called Binhai Mansions because that's Binhai um, Avenue, just where it is. Now, um, this photograph of a space um, is again, to me, uh, an image of something that is essentially invisible. I could tell you that this was, um, I could almost tell you it's an Apple Park. Um, you might know it's not. Um, I could tell you it's in the inside of a big company. I could tell you it's in the foyer where the public's allowed or a big company. I could tell you it's actually in, um, in MoMA, the new MoMA building in New York. I, I, could, I could tell you it's in um, the South Bank Centre in London. I, I could, the image fits any narrative. And again, we, we don't know whether this is a work environment, a leisure environment, a tourist environment. And um, we don't really know what, what, what country it's in or what continent it's in. Um, so um, I'm just going to go back to that now. Um, when I began to work out what was happening to offices in um, in London for, for my book. I, I began, I thought, how can I, find, I where do I start? I have my, my own personal anecdotal evidence. And, um, but how do, I, how do I get data for this? And I realized that uh, urban transit authorities, in London is TfL, in New York is the, uh, what is it, the um, MTA, and then the bars in San Francisco, the Bay Area. Um, they have an incredible amount of data on not only their own services, but, but the way that people travel around the city. And then if you, if you uh, get hold of Google data on top of that, um, you have an incredible rich data source of how people, how workers in a city actually travel around the city. Um, minute by minute, day by day, seven days a week. Um, and if you, get the, if you get enough Google data, you can do genders and you can everything. So you've got a really rich data set. Um, and, and the most remarkable trend is that the morning and, morning and early evening peaks are flattened out. And that the amount of traveling that goes on during the day has gone up and up and up. Um, and instead, so instead of doing two long journeys, morning to go to work and then at the end of the day going back home, people are going in and going around the city, um, shorter journeys, multiple different modes of transport. Um, and um, one began to get a really good picture for how people use the city. Um, I came across two companies recently in London. One is Deliveroo, which food delivery, 
and the other a new a relatively new company and the other is a big very big australian bank called macquarie bank maybe over 100 years old they both had recent office developments in london and like all companies now of that kind they do not have enough workspaces in the in the office in the new office for all their employees and um what was interesting to me was and i don't know if, this is, if there's some golden rule about this but they, they both came out with the same proportion in other words they, they've got one workspace for every one and a half people or two workspaces for three people um i had at the same time as discovering this i'd gone to take my computer to the apple store in norwich and i was chatting to the guy there and he told me that um the apple store and apple has as a corporation has more money than any other corporation in the entire world sitting on more cash so not a question can't afford it but it had decided not to have a meeting room in the apple store because why why bother um norwich is full of lovely cafes so they used to go down to Carlucci's. now they go to another cafe and in a nice way they go to chapelfield park so um th this feeds into another trend that's happening which is that as companies get more competitive and specialized they want to have an office or a space a studio a lab an office that allows them to concentrate on their core business and everything else is outsourced um everything else is outsourced um i was talking this morning with someone who um uh has an office that they've they've gone to they moved from clerkenwell to oxford circus being closer to people is even that short distance is more important um it's a it's a it's a young company of about 20 people they they rented space um a co-working space um 30 percent more expensive but it gives them flexibility and the three directors have become members of a club 100 yards in one direction um and they gave about half of the staff membership for another club in another direction um i was told um uh also very recently that the construction industry training board has moved away from london, central london to croydon and made all its i wasn't quite I, they said everyone it probably isn't everyone but all more their managers um they've given the membership of the century club in Shaftesbury avenue so offices are becoming smaller more focused, everything else is outsourced, and people will no longer go there and stay there, but they will go and meet other people. They may go for a meeting just 100 yards away. And all these trends are, are pushing towards I, what I call third spaces. Third space is neither home nor the office. But it's a space that individuals choose um, where they can do work they can meet people who they're not currently working with but they um, have worked with in the past and their colleagues and maybe friends um, and there's been a huge upsurge in these numbers of specialized third spaces as clubs and often clubs they're always clubs they're often clubs and they're most busy they were originally busy sort of 10 to 6 or 7 and a lot now also are interested in providing events djs quite late at night um so the the, the pattern of work in a way people at work it seems to me are now using not quite the whole city but a big a big part of the city they're going to their office yes we need to go to offices we need to have an office we need to have those water cooler movements with anybody we want but also 
the offices are smaller, much more utilitarian. They are not big enough to have everybody there the whole time. And we will have a personal selection of uh, cafes, memberships of clubs, bars that we personally, personally choose where we are known a little bit to some of the people that run it. So it's, 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 it, we feel at home there. I always say that one should have a job that one feels at home in, in an industry one feels at home in. And these third spaces are where you feel at home in and you can relax and you know how they work. You know what the menu says and you feel this is where I would have the conversations that are important to me. Uh, particularly one-on-one -on -one conversations. People never have one-on-one -on -one conversations in the office anymore. They're all too crowded and too cramped, apart from self-assessment. So the, 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 those are some of the trends that I'm, that I'm, I'm, I'm noticing. Um, there's the, um, uh, the, in a way, the office is, we will all need offices, but the office will become a sort of mothership for people to make their forays out during the day uh, for an hour or so. They, they come a sort of base camp. They become a sort of base camp. We will go there to where the archive is um, when we have an meeting for everybody, that's where we will be. But, but they will be one of, there will be one ingredient amongst many. And increasingly, I've noticed that the more senior people in a office in a company are the ones that use the office least i think that's quite an important pointer um, sometimes the founder of a company chief executive will be there least of all and the, and the people in the organization who stay in the office all day long will be the most junior of all and it, 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 it i found very few exceptions exceptions to that rule so the ones that are the are the are the most senior and are in a way driving the business forward and looking for new opportunities are the ones that are spending the least time in the office um which is which is another reason why why the office is less and less important to, to companies. They need, they need it, it's, it's a tool in the toolbox, but it's not the main thing. And this company that moved from Clark and Wells to Oxford Circus uh, to a co-working space, they have no intent to do co-working. They're not going there to co-work. But what the co-working companies hit upon is flexibility of space, and flexibility of rental periods. And that is what companies want. And I think when this, when this, when the COVID-19 um, uh, runs its course and, 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 and we, we start to look at how we want to live our lives in the future, and including our work, our personal life, our, our work life, more and more people will see an office as a a tool in the toolbox there are many other tools it's one tool in the toolbox there's a statement by the the, uh, the chief executive of barclays over the weekend jeff staley who said um we i wrote it down um here we are large downtown headquarters are a thing of the past we are making major adjustments to how we think our location strategy and i that reminds me, I wrote down another quote from uh, a Canadian academic, Lucas Stevens at McGill. Um, the challenge facing urban planners is where economic activity actually occurs. We suggest it relates to urban space by way of trajectories punctuated by movable nodes rather than fixed locations. And for a long time, um, when I, I was, I studied urban design at the AA, 
uh, it was all about where in the city, where in the urban fabric, residential, office, retail, food and beverages, leisure, etc., open space, where it should all be. Uh, I'm currently involved in two master plans on the outskirts of Beijing, one in Tongzhou, where we're working with at Skidmore, SOM. Um, it's all about where should the offices be? And, 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 and where, where should the leisure activities be? Um, which is sort of, you, know, you, you sort of have to do it, but it sort of misses the point. Um, it's a big site, it's about a kilometer by half a kilometer. Um, we're working with another one right in the center of Beijing, next door to Tenement Square. Um, same conversation, where, where, where should everything be? But the reality, uh, if the Canadians are right, and what they say just strikes home with me, is that we now move around, we, 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 our work is cognitive, we move around the city, we work on projects, we work with people, we need different people at different times. Uh, we organize our contacts with, with, with the same precision as the manufacturer organizes the supply of components, just in time ordering, how the car companies are. The companies that depend on business are just as punctilious about how they organize their conversations with other people. Um, very skillful job. And we use any facility in the city, whether it's breakfast or, or reading some for catch up and a coffee in the morning or lunch or, or, or in Zoom, Zoom, it'll be in the future it'll be Zoom. Um, and the, and, and, the, and the, the places where people want to be and the buildings that they want, both in terms of the structure and the interior design, will be ones that reflect that need and make it easier for people to live to live that kind of life. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end with two quotes that I are a bit extreme, but I but I sort of I, I sort of like them. Um, one is by an artist called Kai, um, a Chinese artist, Kai Ko Jiang, who who is very successful. He he works in huge installations of gunpowder and ink and color, um, often in the open air. Um, and he's currently, he lives, his main studio is in New York. He, he, he lives, he actually lives in New Jersey. And he said, my office mimics a human brain more than an office. So he, he, he conceives of the office as a, a sort of visible symbol of the way that his brain works. Make of that what you will. And then Oliver Larson, um, who has, I know, many studios, but I think it's what he, talking about his studio in Copenhagen, he says, when you step into my studio, you step into a dream world. Um, and I think everybody who now works in this way of pursuing ideas, um, very, very personal ideas, looking around for how to get them to the next stage, who could help me, uh, who can give me a bit of advice, money, support, just make me clearer about it and help me to articulate it. You know, we move around the city um, in, 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 in what's hope, what we hope is an efficient way. And we will choose our spaces um, and they won't be one space. They, they won't have just one space. Uh, we will choose our spaces. Um, to maximize our, in a way, our, our state of mind and our efficiency. So um, there, there's a few thoughts about the, the future of work, and which are based on my book, and a few thoughts about the effect on, on where we work where and when we work, which I hope will, will, will have some resonance to um, um, the way in which offices are conceived and designed and, and organized. Thank you. John, thank you so much. That's fantastic. Um, if you have questions for John, do pitch them in the chat box, please. Um, 
I don't, maybe I can kick off. Um, I, I mean, I, I true like many people, I, um, about the last month has kind of sh shaken my uh, convictions about what an office is for and how um, uh, how necessary it is to to us being productive. Um, at the moment, yeah, uh, with Rosie and I in uh, different parts of London, I sort of feel we're strangely being more productive than ever we were in the same space. Um, and I've had conversations with architects, um, uh, quite large practices who've been talking about um, getting rid of their lease, moving to a model where their practices, the members of their practice are working in a dispersed way, perhaps meeting up, you know, once every kind of fortnight. This much, much greater sort of emphasis on home working. And I guess I wonder, I wonder what, what are the limits of that, um, that, that new model? And particularly, I wonder about them for young people who are starting out in a profession. And my ex own experience of being, uh, you know, having been an architect for seven years was that uh, that period at, when you're out of college and you're you're working in an office environment uh, of those first you know, five years. It's the, the um, just discovering a way of working and a, cu a culture of working and a uh, being in an environment with other people is absolutely fundamental to picking up those skills. And I would, I'm not sure that I would have been able to do it as effectively if I'd been working from my back bedroom. Do you see Wait. that? How, how, do, how do we make sure that, um, yeah, that this transition isn't one that just benefits people who are, um, you know, have quite established skill sets and, and that actually it, it allows people to, to um, discover a, a profession and, and a set of, set of professional skills. I think that's a, that's a really good point. And um, I think when you are, um, when you're work, I mean, you, when you're work, when, when somebody is working out what they want to do, which is actually very difficult because they don't know what they want to do until they try it. Um, and I certainly made, um, I had a great time, but I made lots of, for starts and went down lots, into lots of cul-de-sacs when I was working out what I wanted to do. And the only way I finally worked it out was that when I, when I got together with people and I realized that I wanted to work with these, this particular group of people. It, it was a choice about the people more than the work in a way because the people were dictating the work. And that only happened because I, as a complete novice, was allowed in to sort of observe them and work with them and, and learn with them. And when you're looking for what to do, you've got to somehow get yourself close to people who are much, much better than you are. Um, so I, I hope that companies will continue to, to recognize that and, 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 and benefit from it. Because if someone is getting a job and then told to stay home, they will only be able to do rather primitive and mechanical and routine stuff. And that's really bad for them. And it is bad for the organization. So I, I think there will be a trend towards more um, online working, partly because in certain circumstances, it is very efficient and people like it. Um, partly because the the, the change of the lockdown would be quite gradual, I think. And partly because companies have invested in this system, in many cases, they didn't want to give up their, their investment. Um, but the idea that you need to build up a group of people that do know each other really well and actually like each other. And I have this idea of vulnerability. You've got to, be in an organization where you feel you can be vulnerable with other people. And it's very hard to develop that or, or, or risk that if you're sitting at home looking at a screen, you, you sort of can't do it. So I think it'd be wrong of any organization to say, 
well, everybody worked at home happily for six months. So, you know, let's, let's carry on and see how it goes. That would be a disaster. Yeah. That would be a real disaster. I, I think the companies that will survive and stick it out and, and grow will be the ones that do provide a, um, an environment, um, an office where people do come because they want to come uh, on a regular basis. Um, and where, where they do have the, um, this learning ability and they do have these water cooler conversations. So I think it's tempting to say, gosh, we can do much more than we thought at home. So let's go on doing it. I think guys like I sort of can, um, but I'm living on borrowed time. If you're studying and you're still developing, and you're managing and you're leading, you, you've got to be physically close to people. That's not gonna change. It may not, that physical intimacy, closeness, interaction, interpersonal relationship may not happen only in the office. It may happen in, in a third space, but that will still be needed, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna come next. We have a question from Janaki Ranpura. Uh, Janaki, I can see from your virtual background that you're in a very productive office. Uh, where back to you? Uh, I'm actually in Ohio, but you know what that background is? It's early computing. So those are the women who used to call themselves computers. So I am in a room full of computers, actually. Yeah, of course, it, the word was used for the, for the people, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, what I was curious about, John, thank you for the uh, it's very, very interesting conversation. Um, I was really thinking about I'm going to get the name of the building slightly wrong. Is it Finsbury Avenue, one Finsbury Avenue? Uh, and the way that building was structured for computing in the, in the financial sector and thinking about this thing that you said about the office's base camp, I'm just asking you on a totally speculative level, like what are the amenities in terms of utilities besides the abstract qualities of conviviality and idea exchange that might typify the future office? Well, the, the, um, there's a tendency for offices and including co-working spaces to all look roughly the same. And this is led by the co-working spaces because they've got a global brand. But you can walk into many offices now and it, it looks pretty much like the last one you went into. And I did, in my book, I did make a joke about, you know, you're, you move from one office to another, one company to another, and you might find that the only thing is changing is the password to the Wi-Fi. I mean, everything else is the same. I, I, I think that the, the, um, the way forward is, it's, it's being adopted by quite a few companies, is flexibility and diversity. So if you look behind you, oh, you know what's there, but the serried ranks of, of, of benches, with everybody working the same, and they, were, they would be working the same all day long with very limited breaks. That is the old way. What we need now is spaces that can provide different environments during the day of the different kinds of work that people want to do. I'll, I'll come back to this company, Bob Consulting, that's gone from Clark and Well down to Oxford Circus. And the, the, the traction of going to the company in Oxford Circus, which is owned by the office group, another big, very big co-working organization, is that they have, um, uh, the company's got one dedicated open plan office. It's got one dedicated meeting room. It has access to numerous, I think there are about 17, 18 meeting rooms it can hire. And it has access to about 20, little cubicles and has access to open areas and it's got access to quite a quite a large cafe restaurant so whatever anybody wants to do in the company at any one time they can find a environment that suits the numbers of people they want to have and the kind of conversation they want to have so it's diversity and flexibility. It's more expensive, as I said, they're paying 
30% more than they were paying in their small offices in, in Clerkenwell. Um, but they gain the flexibility and diversity. And I think that's what it is. Um, John, I just, we're wrapping up, but I just want, wondered if you could make some observations perhaps about um, gender and the office and, and how this change, these changing work patterns are likely to impact on women particularly, you know, how, how they, um, obviously the, the nature of the, of the office being a place where work is done has always been problematic for, uh, I think women particularly, where, where childcare issues have come into play. Um, yeah. How do you yeah. see the, 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 the growth of home working um, transforming that situation? I, I think the, the more people work at home um, is, is, is benefiting the person who looks after the house, who is usually the woman. Um, I think parenthetically what's really interesting now is that we have very often two adults and children all, all together and the man and the woman can see each other and in the past they've never seen their partner at work and now they're seeing their partner at work and they're saying like you know is that what you do you know you, you do the same as me so I think that's really interesting I think the main the main impact on gender balance uh, in terms of numbers and gender balance in terms of pay and 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 promotion is going to come um, as more from other things partly the movement that is already in place but also flexible hours working which is when individuals can have more power over choosing the hours that they go to the office so it, it, it's how they slice up their, their week. And flexible working, four day week, I think that is going to have a, a bigger impact on, on gender balance. I, I think that, um, and I, I'm thinking of some stories I told in the book about, um, you know, women still, I, I'm caricaturing here, but men, see the office as a, a, a power arena and women tend to see the office as a place for personal relationships um, as part of it. So, and is that going to change quickly? I don't think it is. I, I think there's a sort of deep embedded problem of that. But I, I think the working at home is going to help. And I think also the flexible working four day week is also going to help as much as not more so.